I want to thank everyone for uh, your prayers. For those of you that were praying for me to get better, I do feel much, much better. Uh, even though I still have a little bit of a, a cold, it is so much better than it was. Um, <clears throat> so I'm glad to be here and uh, feeling so much more uh, filled with energy. Um, I thought we would look at one of the sources of the problem. Problem of unity, uh, rather the opposite of unity, division. Um, so we're going to look at the uh, Tower of Babel today. And it's found in Genesis chapter 11. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Sarnar and settled there. And they made, and they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they made brick for stone and uh, pitman, uh, bitumen for martyr. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which um, Mortar had built, and the Lord said, Look, they are one people, and they, have all, they have all have one language, and this is the, only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they uh, purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, it was called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <coughs> So I'm going to give you two interpretations of this passage. I'm going to give you the traditional one, and then I'm going to give you a modern one. The traditional one is founded on things that are not really in the passage. You just heard the scripture, you just heard the story, and now I'm going to give you the traditional interpretation of this story, and, and everything I say is not really in the text. The traditional story is that this is a pride and punishment story. Now, I never did hear pride, and I never heard punishment in the story, but this is the way it's been traditionally interpreted, that <clears throat> this group of people of one language, of one, uh, they built a city and a tower. Notice it's not just the Tower of Babel, it's a city and a tower. Um, Traditionally, a city uh, for protection would have been built um, and a tower would have been built so that they could see the land around. But the tradition is that out of pride, they built it bigger and taller. And some have interpreted that as um, the worldview for the ancient people when this was written and when this was told as oral story first. Pretend this is a saucer. This would have been the earth, and then if a cup was turned upside down, that would have been the dome over the earth. And so to build a city that was reaching higher and higher and higher, the image, the interpretation is that maybe they were building a city to build high enough to break through the dome in order to access God personally and manipulate God in their, in their own face-to-face. -face. So this is all tradition, not necessarily in the text, right? I didn't read that in there, did y'all? Um, but in their worldview, I mean, I can understand it in some way. If, if God created the world flat and the dome was over to protect people and God was above the dome, trying to get through the dome to access God directly, would have been a prideful act, taking charge of their own destiny and accessing God. And so God, in order to protect God's self, 
uh, in punishment, gave them diverse languages so they were confused and scattered all over the world. So that is the traditional classic interpretation. Some other kind of interesting tidbits is the kind of tower that may have been uh, envisioned in this traditional interpretation is called a ziggurat and it's a step pyramid. You can imagine a step pyramid. Uh, maybe that was what was uh, you know, envisioned for this tower to access, to break through uh, to the realm of God. Um, it's believed that this is a, uh, uh, you know, of course this is a myth story. This is, this is not how evolution happened or how evolution of, of cultures and societies happened. Um, but in ancient worlds, stories were told to try to answer a question. So you can imagine what the question might have been. Why are there different languages? Why are there different cultures? And so a story was handed down of why there were different cultures and different languages. That God, that it was a, that it was God punishing the people for some act uh, that was reaching beyond what they should be, should have been doing. <clears throat> so, with that interpretation of the Tower of Babel, you can see where diversity is seen as a punishment. That the ideal creation of God is one where everyone is speaking the same language. Everyone's all in uniform together. That diversity is punishment rather than positive. So we have this, we do have this negative image in the Bible, and this is not the only place, um, where diversity is seen as a problem, as a problem. And you see at the end that because of this diverse language that there was chaos. And they were named, the city was then named Babel. Interestingly enough, it could have been that they, they were playing on the word Babel for two reasons. When it was recorded here, they were having trouble with Babylon. Uh, the, and so this was a negative image of Babylon, um, which is, um, Babel has kind of two meanings the gate of God, the gate of heaven, but it also means confusion, which is kind of what we say, the babbling, you know, babbling brook is, kind of, you know, um, confusion. <clears throat> so there's a kind of a play on words with both, um, both of that attributed to an enemy, Babylon, an enemy that they would make fun of, of them, that they were the source of, of uh, confusion and ridicule. Anyway, so that's, that's what's uh, in the traditional take of this passage. And you can see how it can be um, some of our negative image of diversity comes from the Tower of Babel. <clears throat> now I want to give you a different interpretation that I believe is more founded in the text. Because everything I told you is not really in the story. The story says that there was one people on earth and there were one language. Now this follows the very chapter after, chapter 10 says, <clears throat> chapter 10 verse, can't read that, 20, yeah. These are the descendants of Ham and their families, their languages, their lands, and their nations. So this is following a chapter that's called the Table of Nations, and it lists all the names and their locations in the known world at that time. And so it, it clearly states that there were already languages. Um, <clears throat> we know that evolutionary uh, uh, is believed that it took um, the language may have begun 100,000 years ago. And so the root of language is still a mystery to us. Um, but for the Bible to be inconsistent, one chapter to say there's a lot of languages, and then the very next sentence uh, in chapter 11 to say uh, that there was one language. You can see evidence that this was a story um, 
that was just that was added. You can see the the um, the oral tradition of this story told around campfires. Uh, but in when it's written down, following in a you know a chapter before it, uh, we see inconsistencies. Now the writer didn't have a problem with that at all. Didn't have a problem with that. So I'm just telling you that um, to help us put in a framework of understanding this as a as a story as a myth story um, I wouldn't I want to be clear to you that I don't see this as history <laughs> okay um, but as a myth story uh, you know I were to tell a story at one time everybody spoke the same language and at that time they were all working together to build this great city and in the city there was a tower and the tower uh, was something that they could be proud of, that they could be known across the land, something we will be known for. And God came down and saw this city and saw what they were building and, and was, said, look at what they are building. It is amazing all that they can do. There is no end of their possibilities. Let's confuse their language and scatter them. That's the story. A modern interpretation of that shows that diversity is a gift from God out of recognition of the people's accomplishments. If you can accomplish this here, what could more could you accomplish elsewhere? So God gave diverse language in order to scatter them for more possibilities. Not as punishment, but as an appreciation for their accomplishments. To me, that modern interpretation is more closely aligned with the actual story. This is one of those examples where we want to add to add our own experience to a text to expand on it in a way that will bring us to a more modern interpretation that is one that is more positive of diversity. So we, I don't know about y'all, but I live with this. I am a United Methodist pastor and I, everywhere I go, I have to encounter difficulty with that title. I, non-Christians will say, well, Christians are just judgmental, prejudiced, and homophobic. Why are you, I don't encounter you that way, why are you a pastor of such an institution? Those are all examples of division. And so I have to overcome that and say, I believe in unity, I believe in diversity, I believe that people can be themselves and still find God and that God can be a part of that diversity. People expect churches now to be the voice of hate, of division, of isolation and separation. This breaks my heart. So it sounds all fluffy and uh, 60s to say that we're going to have a whole month to talk about unity and diversity, but we could not be more relevant to our age. I said this in the prayer, if we were as passionate in our efforts for hate as we are in love, how much could we accomplish? I long for the day when I introduce myself as as a Christian pastor and someone goes, that's wonderful. You are doing such great work in the world. Now, to be truthful, that does actually happen on occasion. Uh, I don't know if you've been to the fish place um, at the the coffee, I mean, the um, taco trucks uh, by the um, post office. 
got a mermaid on, his, on the side of his truck. I would highly recommend his food. Um, I like to go there because he had something really nice to say about me. Um, I know. His food is good, but I really liked, I really liked to be complimented. I, I've gone there enough that he asked my name. And I said, I'm Linda. He said, what do you do? I was, and I, you know, and I go through this awkward moment of, am I going to tell him and then him not like me anymore, you know. <clears throat> so I told him. I said, I'm a United Methodist pastor. And without missing a beat, he said, well, I want to thank you for your good work. I said, what do you, you know what we're doing at the church? No, I don't know what your individual church is doing, but I want to thank you for your work in the world. Do you see the difference? What if we could say that to everyone that introduced themselves as a Christian? I want to thank you for your good work in the world. Yeah, I go back to get his fish tacos. Yeah. That is what we're to be in the world. We're to be a light so that others can see how to live together and be different. It's one thing when everybody's exactly the same. That's what happened in this passage. Everybody's exactly the same. They're all working together for one purpose, building a city they're proud of. It's easy. Then God said, let's they're doing such great work. Let's make it a little bit harder. Let's see what they can really do in the world. Let's give them some diversity. And then they can really accomplish something. Yes, they abandoned that one city to go out and do greater things elsewhere. So we're going to have communion this morning. <clears throat> And as you're taking communion, I want you to have a bigger vision of what's happening here. That when we break one loaf, people all around the world in this 24 hours of Sunday are also breaking a loaf. What would it be like if we felt the unity of that? And yet, we have very diverse experiences. There are a lot of people that would feel uncomfortable being here today. Our flag, our diversity, my language, I'm a woman. There's a lot of people that would be uncomfortable worshiping here today. And yet, we all have the same title as Christian. So as we take communion today, I ask you to feel that biggerness of God's call for diversity. We don't have a monopoly on God's message. Neither does anyone else. So as you take communion and we say the body of Christ, I ask you to feel the fullness of that. Pretend you're an astronaut looking down at this planet. That's the way God sees the fullness of God's activity in creation. Let us have a glimpse of that as we take this one small bread, this one small meal, and know that it can be so great. <clears throat> so next time you encounter someone that's different than you, in some way, and you feel that wall of difficulty. Maybe it even feels like a different language. I ask you to adjust yourself and say, can this be a gift? Can this be a gift? How can I, as a Christian, honor God's diverse creation by encountering this person that is different than me. If Christians around the world were the voice of acceptance of diversity, I dare say human history would be different to this point.
So let your faith guide your next step to acceptance of diversity.